Welcome to another special episode of Gonzaga Nation. I'm your host, Dan Dickow, alongside a truly special guest, someone who doesn't really need the name announcement of who he is. You've seen him for the last five years as such a huge part of the program. Uh, local legend, Anton Watson. So first off, Anton, thanks for joining again. Yes, sir. No problem. So uh, appreciate uh, you joining. It's a chance now that the season's over for uh, our Gonzaga Nation staff, former player like myself. Uh, first off, to say thank you for having a, a tremendous impact on this program, but here's some things from your perspective after spending five years. So first off, thanks for a, tr a truly great career as a Gonzaga Bulldog. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it was a good season and um, my career there, you know, I remember all of it. So, yeah. So let's let's take a, a, a full step back to when you were coming out of high school. And you and I had chatted about this kind of quickly at different times, uh, just because I've known you since you were in high school, probably actually before high school, playing open gyms with uh, John Stockton at the warehouse um, in regards to the fact that you're a local player. You had the opportunity to come to Gonzaga and it was almost like, why wouldn't I go to Gonzaga if you had the opportunity? Um, fast forward all these years later, how happy were you with that decision? Uh, I was super happy. Um, I knew it was going to be a good place for me to get better and, um, you know, be able to showcase my, my skills and basketball skills in front of my hometown. So, um, yeah, just having that experience and, you know, being able to play in front of my family and friends was something special to me. But, you know, I feel like I got better, too, throughout the process and matured and, um, yeah, just kind of went through my own journey. but. No, I appreciate all of it. You mentioned your own journey, and everybody's journey is so different and so unique. A lot of outsiders want to place kind of a timeline or an uh, expectation on what someone's journey needs to be. A lot of times coaching staffs do the same. Yours was unique, I think, in the fact that uh, you came in as a local kid, you, were, you started right away, but then you had a bunch of injuries that you just, for for lack of a better term, you just couldn't escape early in your career. So you weren't able to kind of impact the game that you wanted to. Then you had the selfless attitude of, hey, we might be a better team with Andrew Nemhart and a two-point guard attack. Then you have a number two pick in the NBA draft come in, and you understood like, hey, you know what? He's going to be in the NBA in, in eight months or whatever it is. If I do this, I'm going to improve, and I'm going to be able to excel in these roles. And you did that. So then the last two years as a starter, you, people finally were able to see more of the offensive stuff that you could do. And I know that it's a long way to get to my question is, what was the journey like in regards to each step of the way and accepting your role during those diff different seasons? Yeah. Yeah. Starting with freshman season, I think, uh, obviously, I was starting. Um, I felt good and I was playing good. Um, I got injured, tore my shoulder. So I had to sit out half of the season. And then coming back, you know, it's hard coming off injury. Um, just coming back and trying to be in the starting lineup. I started first half of the season in my sophomore year. And then Andrew started starting. And um, yeah, I just see my minutes kind of go away. So mentally that was pretty tough for me because I never came off the bench. You know, I'm usually a starter on any team I play on. So it was difficult, but um, I just kind of had to change my mindset and um, stay positive throughout that whole situation. And um, yeah, I think I think it helped the team and it helped myself kind of grow. But after that junior year, you know, I kind of had the same mindset of just I'm a, I'm a keep getting better. You know, if I'm not on the court, not getting the minutes I wanted, I'm still still push myself in practice. Going against Chet, you know, that's a that's a pro. Yeah, that's the best you can go against in practice. So that year, you know, that was big for me just my development. And then in the summers, you know, I was just attacking every summer, um, just trying to get my body right, trying to work on my game, my outside three. And then I think my senior year and this this last year, you know, it really came to light and I was just kind of playing like myself again. Yeah, I saw you play in high school. You were dominant at Gonzaga Prep. Um, and you're, everybody's game, when you adjust a level, um, you have to adjust your game depending on how your skill set, your size, your athleticism fits that level game, but also the team that you're playing with. I think one of the unsung things is you kind of touched on it because of your role with each of those teams is each of those teams needed something different from you yeah. and you could provide 
that. That's that in in and of itself is hard to do. Mm -hmm. You mentioned growing up in an athletic family. Is that something like say your dad or maybe your older brother were able to impart on you like, hey, coming off the bench might not be the worst thing because this this approach or this angle or this matchup might more uh, better enhance your opportunities and your ability to grow as a player. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think they instill that in me, just um, that competitive spirit where, you know, you can be selfless uh, to win games. You know, the most important thing is winning games to me and I'm um, super competitive. But um, if I got to if I got to take some minutes out of my game um, for, for the better of the team, I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, I'll never be one of those selfish guys who, who gets mad about that. But, um, you know, when I come in the game, I got to contribute. I got to do something to help the team. So that's kind of how I was thinking about it. I believe you're the third winningest player in Gonzaga history. Um, so that's going to put you kind of up there in, in the regards to all-time NCAA wins as well. I'm, I imagine you've got a huge uh, amount of pride in that. Maybe not at this moment because we're only a couple weeks removed, but years down the road, you'll kind of value that stat, I'm sure, even more. Uh, is there a win uh, or two that really stands out to you as like, hey, that was unbelievable, or maybe a, a win that you felt like you were instrumental in? Not that you weren't instrumental in many, but maybe one that sticks out to you. I would just say both the Kentucky games, you know, we played them here at home last year, and I think I had a good game. I, maybe like a double-double, but just to beat them at home, um, the crowd was crazy. Um, Kentucky... You know, anytime you play them, they got all the athletes, all the draft picks. And, um, yeah, that was a big win. And then we went went there this year and beat them at their place, which was – I think that was probably the funnest game I've ever played in my career, just yeah. regular season-wise. But, um, yeah, that was a crazy game. You know, Gonzaga has been known for going and playing at, at any opposing gym's arena. Uh, I've never played in Rupp. I've called a game for, for Westwood Learn Radio there, and it's unique. It's yeah. huge for oh, a man. college – uh, state arena and it's it's got tremendous fa fan loyalty there. Yeah. Um, was that the best road environment you had played in? Yeah, I would say so. I'll say one of the best. Um, just they have like an NBA arena and just all the stuff they do before the game. Um, you can just you get chills just warming up. So I'll say there BYU. When, when we played them at home, it was always crazy, and they fill out the whole stadium. So I'll say those two places are probably the craziest places I've played in. So let's go back to that game at Kentucky. And I watched that game at home, and it was like rinse, repeat with the same offensive <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> loop over the top to a pick and roll, and it was either Graham or Braden Huff had a couple good catch and finishes in that. You had some unbelievable dive cut opportunities, uh, you know, baskets on the, the glass and things. When you as a player see that you guys have cracked the code, so to speak, to beat a team, and Coach Few is running the same thing over and over again, are you like, we got this? Or, or what's going through your head when you kind of kind of get that run going in Kentucky? Yeah, no, you just get that confidence. Um, if they can't stop the play, you know, you just you just keep running it. I think that, yeah. <laughs> that it's obvious. Um, and they didn't have too many big guys that could stop Graham or B Huff, so – um, we just kept running the same play, kept getting buckets, and um, yeah, defense. I think we kind of started locking down the last couple minutes of the game, which was huge for us because they got the best offense in the country. So, yeah, that game that game was super fun, but it wasn't it wasn't too difficult. It was just running the same play over <laughs> over yeah. again. No, it was, and that's something that as you and we'll talk about this uh, throughout the rest of the interview, kind of prepare for uh, a professional career and hopefully in the NBA is that's something that when an NBA team or a professional team finds a weakness, they'll mm -hmm. run it over and over again with a few small wrinkles, whether it's spacing, whether yeah. it's an action on the weak side. So uh, there's your early uh, entry into understanding the game <laughs> yeah. at that level. Yeah. Um, uh, let's talk about the Purdue game. Um, picked up your fourth foul, and a lot of people thought that changed the dynamic of the game. Was it a good foul? Was there a, maybe a foul in the first three that shouldn't have been called that you felt impacted the game and, and what was your what was your take on your final game as a bulldog yeah for me um the fouls I think it got it got me um yeah I know the second foul I fouled Fletcher Lloyd he pumped fake me that was, that's a foul third foul I think we were running down the court I bump into someone it's a, it's a physical game I'm like it was pretty weak but um probably could have been smarter there and then the fourth foul 
you know, I'm just trying to box out ED. Yeah. He's 7'4", 300 pounds. It's like, you just got to get him away from the hoop. And um, I guess they got me on that. But um, it's a physical game. So, you know, I was pretty frustrated. Um, I didn't want to go out, you know, sitting on the bench, fouling out. But, um, yeah, I think we played played good, you know, did our best. But um, it's hard. You play against Edie, he's yeah. fouling out all three of your bigs. Yeah, I mean, I, I do remember that call. It was uh, it was questionable because that is something that could have been called on literally every possession yeah. against a guy like Edie who more times than not is the one that creates that <laughs> yeah. initial contact because he's sure. so big. Um, but with that being said, like, you guys played against Purdue twice, and you were in both games. Yeah, you you lost to UConn in what my eyes and share me your experience. That was the only game you guys really weren't in throughout the year. I yeah. mean, after about eight minutes, it's like, damn, UConn is freaking good. Yeah, um, give us your take on both those two teams when you watch the national title game, knowing that hey, you did make the ninth straight Sweet Sixteen, and you guys were pretty damn good this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I was actually talking to uh, Kurt, one of our one of our coaches, yesterday, and he's saying, you know, out of our six losses, two of them were to Purdue, one of them was to UConn. Um, but yeah, just watching that game, I thought UConn was going to win. I, I felt like they were going to win it all since since we got out. So just how they play and their pace and um, their sets on offense, it's like they just look. They look good. They look professional. Um, Defense-wise, they're locking up. For Purdue, you know, Zach Eady's a beast, but I just feel like they need some more pieces. Uh, they got all the shooters, but when you come against a good defensive team and just teams that's going to run you down on the offensive end, uh, like UConn, um, I don't think Purdue could have kept up with them. Yeah, UConn was a well-oiled machine. Yeah. I, mean, I, I had one broadcast of theirs this year, and I was impressed from shoot-around to pregame prep yeah. to actual product on the floor. They were head and shoulders above pretty much everybody they played. Um, we touched on Zach Eady. I would imagine he's the, the toughest matchup that you had to face. Granted, he wasn't your primary assignment, yeah. but you had plenty of possessions against him. Yeah. Would he have been the toughest matchup this season? And if not, who was? Nah, it's, it's got to be him. Um, I'm trying to think of who else we played, but there's no one compared to him. It's the a, only one that – sorry to interrupt, but I, I think the only one that would come to mind really quickly, there's two guys, would have been Keon Brooks at UW and Ladee at San Diego State oh, for yeah. different reasons. I mean, those two and in, in, uh, in Edie would have been the, the, the toughest matchups, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think Edie still the best that I matched up against in him. Ladee's actually really good. He's strong as hell. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Zach Eady, you don't really have an answer for that. Yeah. You try you try to throw everything at him and it's like you can't really you can't double, can't do really anything with him. Yeah. I mean, it's not every day that you get to you're you're having to prepare for a seven four guy. <laughs> it's not just seven four, but his skill that it understands yeah. angles and the team runs pretty much every offensive set through him. Um, so let's talk about Overall, who's been your toughest matchup in your five years at Gonzaga? And you, we can include practices because you went back and forth with Drew Timmy, yeah. went back and forth with Chad Holmgren, uh, Petrushev before he went back to Europe. I mean, you had to battle against a lot of good players in practice, too. Yeah. Nah, it, there's a lot of good players I played against. Um, even like Gary Bell, he used to practice us freshman year. Okay. And he looked like the best player I've ever seen. Like, he was cooking everyone. Um, but yeah, practices were crazy. You got Chet, Jalen, Drew, going against Drew, Corey. It's like, yeah, practices, you just get better every day. And then in games, some games I remember, Brandon Miller, he dropped I yes. think, like 37 on us. We still won, but yeah. it was like, yeah, he, he wasn't missing. But yeah, that's, that's one I remember probably the most, just because he dropped so many. Yeah. And he's having a good rookie year, too. Yeah. So that's funny you mentioned that because, like, for me as a former player, if somebody who's like, who is your toughest matchup, I'm going strictly point guards because that's all I yeah. guarded. Yeah. You were going from Jalen Suggs in practice, Corey yeah. Kispert as wing, to Chad Holmgren as a four, to yeah. Drew Timmy as a low post scorer. Zach, like, how, do you, how did your defensive mentality um, develop? And 
what is it that enables you to guard that many skill sets and have success against them? Because um, I think that's the thing that's going to give you uh, a, an opportunity to get into a big time professional career. And then the other things you'll work on and you'll grow into uh, once you kind of realize in that setting what you need to do. Yeah. Uh, for me, it started in high school. Um, just my high school coach, Manny McIntyre, um, just you've seen G prep play. Yeah. It's just strictly defense. Um, our games would be like 50 to 32. <laughs> and um, yeah, we just emphasize, emphasize defense all season, all four years I was there. And then even Stockton uh, playing on his AAU team, you know, he just kind of has the mind games that you, you tell yourself and um, you, you, he doesn't talk smack, but you know, you kind of get into other people's grills, try yeah. to get in their mental. And um, that's kind of how I look at it, you know you can use that as an advantage on the defensive end because everyone's just worried about scoring and how many points they scored. And, and defense-wise, you can you can really use that as a tool. And you can get easy buckets off of, off of steals and stuff. Yeah. So that's how I see it. So when you look at the next level, uh, mention the, the ability to guard multiple positions. Offensively, you know, um, where are those – what are the skill sets or the, the parts of your game that you have to enhance? Um, between now and you go to pre-draft workouts um, and the, the hopefully the combine, those things? Yeah, uh, I got to be able to hit knock, knock down open open threes. I think that was the biggest thing. Corner threes, you know, wing threes, just be a spot-up shooter. And, um, yeah, I think just getting stronger in my body right, uh, that's the biggest thing. That's a lot of feedback that I got from last year is you got to be in the best shape. Um, you know, you got to pass the eye test, really. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, that, I think that was the biggest thing for me. Uh, a lot of teams like how I play, like how I pass. You know, they like like my feel of the game. But, yeah, being able to knock threes down because the game's changing. And, yeah, I think I think getting my body right is the biggest thing. So you've, uh, you've you had the advantage of being around John Stockton playing some AAU, uh, being around the warehouse, and then you've had the advantage of, of being around pros at Gonzaga. We mentioned – Kiss Burton Suggs and, and Chad Holmgren and other guys. Any advice that any of those guys have given to you now that your college career is over and you're truly focused on your next steps? Because what a lot of people don't realize is you got to be great at one thing. Sorry, you got to be great at the college game first yeah. to impact it in college. But the pro game is completely different. Now you're shifting to the point where you really got to focus on yourself over the next few weeks. What's the best advice you've been given by any of those guys? Uh, yeah, just just act like a pro, really. I think that's the most advice that I've gotten from, from everyone is just, you know, once you hit that level, you got you to gotta be a pro. And they were telling me that last year. So that's kind of been my mindset, um, just what you eat, um, what you do off the court. If you're watching the game, you know, watch film, uh, just always thinking about it. So, um, yeah, I think just having that mindset is, is really like you professional now. You got to take it as a job and, you know, you got to you got to work on everything. So I think that was yeah, that was the biggest advice that, you know, just be a pro. So who do you maybe look at as a pro and try to emulate to become like? Mm. There's a lot, um, you know, a lot of comparisons I got from other guys, uh, like GMs and stuff. Uh, it's like Grant Williams, they say I could be, sure. you know, more active Grant Williams. Uh, I don't know. There's, you know, I feel like my game's unique, but to compare it to a lot of guys in the NBA, I try to take pieces from sure. kind of everyone. Um, going to the NBA, I don't think I'm going to be like a Jason Tatum, but, you know, I can still take things from his game, what he does in the post. Um you know, his post phase, I like I like how he plays. So, you know, just taking pieces from everyone's game and just kind of, you know, implementing my own. So let's go back to your stretch of Gonzaga. So um, spent five years. Did you have a maybe a most memorable moment? I know that undefeated team that lost in the Baylor to Baylor in the championship game had a lot of memorable moments. Jalen Suggs shot in the Final Four. Um, was it that Kentucky game that we mentioned? But give me maybe one or two of your favorite moments. Yeah, um, for sure. it it got to be uh, the final four. Just being in the hotel with your teammates for a month, I don't think you can forget that. And uh, we were just spending so much time together, enjoying that time. And um, 
yeah, Jalen hit one of the biggest shots ever in college basketball. Um, that was just a crazy experience and be part of. And um, yeah, it was it was super special. And then even that Alabama game last year where Brandon Miller was cooking, um, I feel like I had a super good game. And that was like one of the first times my grandpa, uh, he lives down in Tennessee. You got to come watch. So Awesome. Um, yeah, he, he was saying, you know, my good luck charm. You know, he was super excited, <laughs> talking smack to all the Alabama fans, you know. Yeah. So that game made me super happy just uh, that he was able to make it. And yeah. I played well. So you, uh, Jalen Suggs being a memorable shot to be a part of, uh, you know, Gonzaga Nation kind of has born been born out of uh, Scorebook Live Sports, SB Live Sports. Obviously, we covered you at Gonzaga Prep. Um, you hit a couple big game winners at the state tournament, if I remember right, against Richland. Yeah. Would that be your favorite memorable shot that you made, <laughs> or do you have one at Gonzaga that you remember making? Uh, that one, that I'll say shot, like buzzer beater, that's got to be it for me. Like That was probably one of my best shots, um, most memorable shots, actually. And, um, yeah, that was just special just because – it was a semifinals. We we hate Richland, Gonzaga Prep. We don't like <laughs> Richland at all. Yeah. But yeah, um, we needed it, and I hit that shot. But I'll say at GU, it's probably got to be a dunk. Uh, something I remember most. Just uh, I had a dunk at Pepperdine. I think that one was crazy. It was a sophomore year, COVID season. Um, well, dunk. With the COVID season, it doesn't matter. Yeah, if it's COVID I don't or think I don't think there's a lot no of fans at the Pepperdine gym yeah. watching. <laughs> But I, I punched on him, and um, yeah, it was. I don't think a lot of people expected me to do that, yeah. so it was, it was cool. Yeah. Well, I, th I mean, talking about being at the top of the zone, getting a steal, that's where you made your mark early and earned yourself minutes. If you were, it, and I'm sure you did this as a host on recruiting visits, if you were to talk to a prospective Gonzaga player talking about how can you become an impact player early in your career at Gonzaga, what would you share with them? Kind of just like Dusty's role this year, um, you know, he made such a big impact and he was starting, um, had to come off the bench kind of like my freshman year, but um, he kept getting better um, throughout the season. He Even that game against uh, McNeese, he had a huge game, hitting threes. And, you know, he just kept his confidence up, you know, trying to find ways to, to help out the team. You know, he didn't get down that he had to come out the starting lineup. And um, defense-wise, rebounding um, he always brought energy with that and I feel like that's that's the biggest thing when you're a freshman coming on a new team you know you got to do something to impact and um yeah my mom she's like that dusty kid he reminds me of you <laughs> I'm like yeah I like I like dusty too yeah and um yeah he just he just impacts the game so um yeah this year was uh, an interesting one for the fact that the expectations were so high early on yeah you guys dropped a couple. Um, against really good teams, which I think was overlooked by the average fan who started to question some things. <laughs> I, I know yourself and a couple other guys made some comments uh, to different media outlets like, hey, didn't believe in us now, don't believe in us later. Yeah. You know, that's that athlete mantra is like, hey, block out all the noise. We're just going to do what we can do. If you don't believe in us now, don't come jump on the bandwagon later. Yeah. That had to have been difficult because you're from Spokane. You know how passionate the fans are mm -hmm. about Gonzaga Bulldogs and, and the success that they have. What was your approach when people were questioning on the outside that didn't know how how things were going on the inside? Because I would see it uh, when I would go to shoot-arounds or I would see it when I you watch the fine details of a broadcast when I'm calling it. This team's good. Yeah. There's no way they're not getting the NCAA tournament. You were just looking for a, a, a win that sparks everybody, all the outsiders' interest. What was that like going through that process this year, and how frustrating might that have been? Um, I'll say it was pretty difficult at first. I'm not going to lie. Um, just hearing all the fans, you know, even the analysts saying that, you know, we're not the same team and uh, we suck. It's like we know we're not the same team, but it's going to take some growth throughout the season. I think any basketball fan, basketball player understands that um, pretty much a new team, I would say, you know, new starting lineup, new guys. Um, it just took us a while to figure it out. And, um, yeah, just the outside noise, I think we all blocked it out at some point. Yeah. You know, there's a point in the season where it's like you hear it and uh, you kind of pay attention to it and then you just got to block it out. 
and um, start focusing on yourselves. And um, I think that was just the message that we all had is like, if you're not rocking with us now, you know, once you start winning, don't don't jump on the bandwagon. And well, thankfully, not too many Gonzaga fans jumped off the bandwagon. Yeah. They stayed, obviously. But what are you going to miss most about playing in the McCarthy Athletic Center and being at Gonzaga? Yeah, it's, de it's definitely the fans and just the atmosphere. Um, it's a special place, the kennel. Um, anytime you get to play in there, it's, you know, you got to embrace it, um, never take it for granted. And, um, yeah, it's just special. Being part of the program, it's, it's a big family. Coaches, players, you know, everyone just feels connected. So, yeah, the whole the whole university is super special to me. Uh, coach Few, Hall of Fame coach, he's going to be in the Olympics. Uh, well, he's not in the Hall of Fame yet, but he's for sure going to be there. Yeah. Um, what's something about Coach Few and his coaching style or his personality that – now that you're a former player of his, maybe you can share. Because, yeah. uh, you know, I played there when he was kind of first coming up, uh, you know, establishing himself as a head coach. And it's been fun to hear stories from different eras when Coach Few was a grad assistant to when he was second in command behind Mons to the head guy to now be in this future Hall of Famer. Everybody sees it different kind of steps along his path. But what what's something about Coach Few for you? Yeah, Uh I say something I appreciate from, from Coach Few is just, you know, how hard he pushes people. And um, he pushed me all five years. You know, he never wanted me to be complacent or, you know, relaxed, even throughout my senior years. And, you know, that's that's something I don't want. I don't want to be relaxed uh, going into practice, you know, taking plays off. You know, he, he's always pushed me and um, always wanted me to, to do better, make layups if I miss them. You know, he don't mind me, like, make a layup. But, yeah, he – Sometimes he tries to get under your skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> yeah, and um, you get kind of pissed. Uh, but it's it's not even like he's not even cussing. He's not talking smack. He just he just says these little things that yep. gets under your skin. It's like it might stick with you for a little while, but you know you just kind of gotta block it out and um, you know just get back to work. But yeah, I'll say that's the biggest thing: getting under your skin. And, yeah. Trying to those little jabs that he throws at you, you know, they hurt sometimes. Yeah. But um, it definitely makes you play harder and, and pushes you. And it's funny because you also have the the difference in the fact that you know his kids go to Gonzaga mm -hmm. Prep where you went, so yeah. you've known him in in a, kind of a different setting. Yeah. Uh, G Prep supporting of his kids' athletic program in high school, then yeah. now being a coach. How do you expect that or hope for that transition to go as now he supports you? embarking on a pro career yeah no he he's full support um you know after the season you could just tell you know how proud of proud of uh, me he was yeah I just kind of take took me some time to just realize you know he wants the best for me um he's prepared me to get to this point and um he just wants me to go all out um going in his pro career uh, he has full confidence in me and you know if a coach believes in you um believes in that um it gives the player so much confidence. So, you know, I just appreciate everything he's done for me to this point. That's 100% truth. When a coach believes in you, it gives you so much confidence as a player, and I can speak to that. But um, you're now about to embark on getting yourself ready. So it's all, yeah. we're, it's all focused on getting Anton Watson as good as he can be in shape, skill-wise, understanding of, of how the pro game works versus the college game. Uh, how do you – how are you going about getting yourself ready for a uh, hopeful NBA draft combine invite? Um, and what does the next couple months look like for you? Yeah, so I'm going to be training uh, probably out in Tampa. But, yeah, I think the biggest thing is getting my body right. So I'm going to be doing a lot, of, a lot of lifting, a lot of just conditioning, you know, just preparing. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of workouts coming up probably next month in um, the NBA combine. Um, but throughout that whole month, it's crazy. It's like you're just flying every single day to a different different city and working out with a team, and you got to make that first impression. Um, you know, they watched your games before. Um, they talked to your coaches a little bit, but once you're there in person, um, you just got to play 100%, you know, show your game, and then you talk to the coaches. And, um, yeah, it just all kind of happens so fast, though. Yeah. Um, it's within, like, a month or two and you have, what, 20 workouts with teams and then the combine within that, which is about a week long. 
So, yeah, it's not too much time to be sitting around. It's going to be a lot of work. Well, if uh, anybody remembers how hard you worked as a, as a Gonzaga player, you're, you'll put everything into this next little stretch and, and be as prepared as possible. Uh, and best of luck with those upcoming workouts. Uh, they're fun. They're grueling. But the biggest advice that I can give you is uh, be yourself yeah. and don't back down because yeah. there's a reason you were successful in the college game and so many of the attributes that you have do translate to that next level. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, so any, a lot of people watching this have seen you play for five years, but if there's somebody that is coming across an Anton Watson description for the first time as a, as a player, how would you describe your game? Yeah, I would say big defender, uh, switch, you know, one through five. I think I can switch one through five, uh, point guard, center. I feel like I can guard them all. Um, just kind of offensively, I feel like I do a little bit of everything. You know, I pass good, um, good feeder to the post, um, good finisher. And yeah, being able to knock down threes, you know, I feel like I got a lot better at that. And yeah, just... A good guy to, you know, gel everything. I feel like an offenses, offense, um, I can get an offense flowing and um, have a good feel for that. But, yeah, just a little bit of everything. Yeah, Coach Few uh, gave a, a player one of the best compliments, and he gave it to you, is he called you a problem solver. Yeah. And on that's on both ends of the floor because every possession in the game of basketball, something has to be figured out, yeah. whether it's where your advantage is or how to take away an offensive team's advantage, and, and you did that on both ends of the floor. So, uh, last question before we let you go is, uh, you spent five years at Gonzaga. You became an integral part of the program. Um, you're from this community of Spokane, also across the border into Post Falls and Coeur d'Alene. But is, do you plan for Spokane to be your home? Do you see coaching in your future at some level when your, your playing career is done? What's, what's in the future for Anton Watson? Yeah. Um, haven't really thought too far about that, um, coaching wise. Um, but yeah, I love Spokane. Uh, I can see myself living here when I'm older, but you just never know. You know, I'm gonna let my journey take me where it takes me. But you know, if I end up in Spokane, I'm not gonna be upset about that. And um, coaching, I think I can see myself coaching. You know, right now I'm like, I don't know. I see my dad <laughs> coaching, my brother coaching, and but. Once I get older, I know I'm going to still love the game. And um, eventually, if I have kids, you know, I'm definitely done coaching. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, Anton, again, thank you for five great years as Gonzaga Bulldog. You are definitely one of the all-time greats uh, for, for many reasons. I wish you nothing but the best of luck as you prepare for uh, what hopefully is a long and productive professional career. And hopefully it's at that NBA level because uh, with the way the game is played, I think that there's a very real possibility there. So best of luck and thanks for joining. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. For Gonzaga Nation, Anton Watson. I'm your host, Dan Dickow.